want to hurt people. I want to kill people, but I don't want to want that. I wish it wasn't that way. Out of the, I don't know, hundreds of people that I've had a part in putting in prison in my 25 year career, Daniel Marsh is in the top three of the people I'm most scared of if they get out. Every time I look at someone, in my mind, I see flashes of images of me killing them. Claudia and Oliver both enjoying the latter stages of their lives while a struggling psychopathic teenager is most definitely not enjoying his. Could this have been avoided? Perhaps. Let's get into the story. Good morning to you all and thank you again for clicking on the video. Today we have another story which you may enjoy. If you enjoy true crime, don't forget to like, comment and let me know what you think of the video. We will be posting hopefully every Thursday true crime, unsolved and solved stories. Now enjoy the show. For this story today, we're off to Davis, California. Davis is known for bicycles. Yes, you hit it right. Bikes. They're known for bikes because it is the number one mode of transportation in Davis. Davis is also known for the University of California, which employs up to a staggering amount of 25,000 people in the Davis area. Oliver, who was known as Chip by friends and loved ones, he was an 87-year-old man, while his wife, Claudia, was a 76-year-old woman. Oliver served in the United States Navy during World War II. He was described as a prominent attorney, a role he would continue until his passing. Oliver, he was a musician at Puta Creek Crew Dads. He was the lead singer and guitarist. And he was also a founding member at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Davis. Claudia was a pastoral associate at the Davis Unitarian Church. Also, her role would have been to provide spiritual direction and pastoral counselling while she was there. She was also active in her local theatre. She was known for her boisterous laughter and making everyone around her feel valued and loved. They both met at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Davis and they have been happily married since 1996. Claudia had three children while Oliver he had six children along with two stepchildren from a previous marriage. Oliver and Claudia's joint family included 11 children, 14 grandchildren and 8 great-grandchildren. On the night of April 13th, 2013, Claudia and Oliver would have went to their usual nighttime routine they would have they would have washed up they would have brushed their teeth and they probably would have sat in bed probably read a book or maybe they would have watched tv or maybe both and then they would have they would have said their love their i love yous to each other and they would have turned in for a, a usual night's sleep fast forward to the next morning they were both missing from the church which is very out of, out of the ordinary for both of them and it was it was alarming and which led to Oliver's door ringing them but she didn't get any answer. It was then that night that they had contacted the police concerning the welfare of the couple. Police and Claudia's daughter Laura, they went to the house to check on them. After there was no answer on the front door, Laura, she went around the back and she looked through the window. But from the window she could see that there was the window was open but there was a protector on the window which looked to be either destroyed or else it was sliced through and then when she continued to look through the window she seen blood stained bed clothes it was then that uh, she went to the police and she told them what they what she seen the police were obviously with her at this moment at the house so they broke down the front door they went in and they seen the bodies of claudia and Oliver on the, in the bed. They both had over 50 stab wounds each and the crime scene was described as horrific by the force responders. I won't get into too much details of the crime scene due to the respect of the families. Now, at the crime scene, there, could have, there, was, there was no physical evidence at all. The police couldn't, they couldn't gander up any physical evidence. So, the families of both Claudia and Oliver, they were getting very frustrated and they were very angry with the cops, understandably, but the cops, they couldn't do anything, they couldn't find anything. So it would be two months later since the murders that 
the cops they would receive a breakthrough on the case. On June 16, some time after the murders, the police received a tip from a teenager. This teenager, he was in school, so they brought in the teenager for questioning and he admitted his friend at school was admitting to killing the couple and he described it in great, great detail. He said the name of the friend who admitted this, his name was Daniel William Marsh. He was 15 at the time of the alleged murders, so the police, they, they brought him in for questioning the next day. Who is this now 16 year old Daniel? Let's take a look at the background of Daniel before we proceed with this case. Daniel, upon first glance, he was a, an all-round child. When he was 10 years old, he actually saved his dad by doing CPR on him when he was having a heart attack. And for this, he received um, a Heroes Award. Uh, all of a sudden, he passed out and sort of flew back into his seat. I grabbed onto the steering wheel and... Uh, directed it off to the side of the road, uh, started pounding on his chest, and after about 30 seconds, he came back. Now, the same year that Daniel's dad had a heart attack, his, his mom and dad had a divorce because it was found that Daniel's mom was having an affair with Daniel's previous teacher. It was at this time uh, Daniel started feeling homicidal urges. He would have dreams of killing people and plan to murder people he didn't like. When Daniel was 11, he told a therapist he had dreams of torturing people and his desire to make them come true. May 2010, Daniel was prescribed antidepressant drugs, Prozac. He had to take two a day. Now we're coming into the teenage years of Daniel. Daniel was going back and forth from his mother's to his father's house as they, they had split up. His homicidal orders were becoming more frequent. He had told a school counsellor that he wanted to massacre everyone at the school and that everyone he sees he wanted to kill and expressed how he wanted to become a serial killer. The school they had called the police but it was determined that Daniel posed no danger to himself or to others and no further action was taken which was a, a big mistake. A psychiatrist from Kaiser Permanente diagnosed him with severe depression and anxiety. According to forensic psychologist and psychopathy expert Matthew Logan, Daniel is a psychopath scoring 35.8 out of 40 on the psychopathy checklist. Right, so now we know the background of Daniel, so we're gonna go back to where his friend gave him up and he gave his name and we're going to go to the day where daniel was bought in brought in for questioning which was on the 17th of june so it's now the 17th of june daniel came in for questioning along with his high school resource officer these officers are basically officers placed in schools they're responsible for the safety of the children and the people working in the school and they prevent crimes in schools Daniel was then interrogated by Davis Detective Ariel Panita and FBI Special Agent Chris Campion. Daniel tried to talk his way out of the murders, pleading his innocence for the first three and a half hours. After this, he began to crack. He began to speak, he said, and I quote, That night I just couldn't take it anymore. I had to do it, I lost control. Daniel admitted to the murders and explained that night how it all unfolded. Daniel explained on the night of the 13th of April, he waited between the hours of 2 to 3 a.m., then left his mom's house on Illard Drive to look for someone to kill. He was armed with a six-inch book knife walking the street looking for open doors and windows. Daniel said he had checked up to 40 to 50 houses before he came across 4006 Cowell Boulevard, just two doors down from where his father lives. This would have been uh, an 18 minute walk for Daniel. The window was opened, but the screen was on protecting it. Daniel sliced open the screen and slipped through the window at the residence of Claudia and Oliver. He waited in the living room until he could hear sounds of snoring. When he heard this, he then entered the bedroom to find both of them asleep. He then watched them and he decided how he was gonna kill them. At this point, Daniel said he felt exhilarated thinking, this is it, it's coming true. He said he described it as a, an hour body experience. It was at this point, Claudia, she woke up. She spotted Daniel at the end of her bed and she, she began to scream, understandably. Daniel began stabbing her in the torso, continued to do so as she pleaded for him not to. Then Oliver woke up and he stabbed him to death as well. The killings, they basically gave Daniel a high for a few days and he admitted to try and kill again. He said the next time he planned to wander Davis streets and beat someone to death with a bat, but he, he couldn't find any victims. 
After the interrogation and Daniel admitting to kill the couple, Daniel pleaded not guilty to two counts of first degree murder. After a five week long trial, Daniel was charged with first degree murder on two counts and given 52 years to life. California law will allow him to be paroled after 25 years. He was tried as an adult and given a sentence of 52 years to life, but now he's been formally diagnosed as a psychopath and his lawyers are moving to have him released next year when he turns 25. The new rule came in which doesn't allow kids to be tried as adults. And when Daniel was standing trial, he was a kid and he was tried as an adult. Let's hope he doesn't get released anytime soon. As looking at the evidence of this case, Daniel is 100% better off behind bars so he cannot hurt anyone else. My thoughts are with the families of the victims. In your prison records, you repeatedly tell your therapist you cannot remember the offense. Is that true? Uh, that's what I've told him, but it's not true. Why would you say that? Because I haven't wanted to remember it. Why not? Because it was unbelievably horrific and horrendous and it's hard for me to even wrap my mind around how I could have done something that awful. And I guess I've just been afraid to actually face that. So here he is saying, I no longer have those feelings or those fantasies and I can't even go back to thinking about it. Your reaction? I think he's trying to manipulate the judge to making him seem better than he really is. Those things just don't disappear. Um, on their own without intensive therapy and really dealing with it. And you can see that the blank emotion behind his words, that there's, there's really no empathy there. Um, and he's not wanting to talk about it because he knows that if he talks about it, he's going to have some cues to show that he still really gets joy from them. But if you get up close to him, you can see his eye twitching the whole time as I would approach, she would get very defensive. During defense questioning, he kind of drank water and was very loose, but he crushed a cup in his hand during my cross-examination that I didn't even see. So I don't believe any of those thoughts or feelings are gone. I think he's just gotten better at masking them. Thank you very much for watching the video. Um, I, really too, I really, really, truly appreciate the support you've been giving the channel. We we received a lot of subscribers from TikTok, which is motivating me now to make more videos. It's nice to see people actually liking the videos, even if it's only five to six likes or a couple of comments. We still truly appreciate it, and we enjoy any support at all, any bad or good comments, um, any criticism but thank you very much for watching the video if you like to please subscribe comment and like the video and until next time see you later